Okay, thank you, Dr. Antonio. Um, and thanks for everybody for participating. I'm just gonna share my screen now. Everybody see that, good? Okay, um, so I'll take about 20 or 25 minutes uh, to talk uh, the one phase of the presentation. I'm gonna focus uh, on, on primarily uh, skeletal muscle, but I will talk about some of the new emerging uh, evidence that Dr. Forbes and uh, Dr. Antonio, uh, we've all collaborated quite a bit on uh, recently, and then I'll mention uh, a little bit of, of bone, uh, of the potential of creatine on bone. Um, there's my social media handles if you need to contact me, email, Twitter, Instagram, or uh, uh, Facebook. So the effects of creatine supplementation on body composition and muscle performance. So most of us that are tuning in, obviously you're very familiar with creatine. So as a bit of caveat, all the research that you've actually uh, read or heard about has primarily been on creatine supplementation. But as you, most of you guys know that you can actually get dietary creatine through red meat, seafood, and, and small amounts through uh, poultry and even, even dairy. But the highest concentrations would be in animal-based products. Uh, I'll throw up a slide a little bit later on why it's so difficult to get the dosage of creatine that has been shown to be effective through natural food products. Um, and that leads into some responders versus non-responders. So again, as a little bit of a caveat, the majority of uh, research studies that look at creatine is focusing on creatine supplementation. And the majority of well-documented research is on monohydrate. So uh, for the remainder of on my presentation, the results are focusing on the monohydrate that's creatine is linked to water. And we'll talk about why we think that is extremely beneficial. So I was part of the International Society of Sports Nutrition uh, stand with Dr. Antonio about three years ago, led by Dr. Rich Kreider. And this is fairly basic. It, it's encompassing over a century of research. So creatine is a nitrogen containing compound or an organic acid primarily produced in our kidneys in the first step. And obviously uh, uh, the end product is in our liver, but basically it's three amino acids coming together, arginine, glycine, and methionine. So it's an elegant process. It's involving primarily two uh, organ systems. And that may be some of the myths or speculations why creatine could impair a uh, kidney or liver function. And actually in the, in the fall, uh, uh, it's a little bit of a, a prelude, um, Dr. Antonio, myself, and Dr. Forbes, we're actually writing a really good review paper on the myths of creatine. So if you have any questions or some myths that you're speculating, put those in the Q&A, and Dr. Forbes, myself, or Dr. Antonio can answer those. But about two thirds of the dietary creatine that we consume either through food or uh, supplementation practices gets stored in skeletal muscle. And about 95% of that is uh, phosphocreatine. So if you go back to your basic biology, phosphocreatine is highly used and is sacrificed to maintain ATP levels. So as you're exercising at a high capacity, you want to maintain ATP. So this is what we refer to as your anaerobic alactic system. Creatine taken into the body can expand this alactic system. So think of a 100 meter sprint, a really, really heavy bench press, leg press, or something really explosive. A lot of athletes or exercising individuals really want to target or enhance that system. In, in other words, that kind of makes them bigger, stronger, faster. So the overall theory here is if you can increase your fossil creatine stores through habitual dietary practices or more readily through creatine supplementation, you can actually get an increase in ability to recover fossil creatine or maintain ATP. So this um, graph here is very simple, but I think it does a really good job of showing what's happening if you do multiple sets, such as bench press, uh, running track and field, whichever it is. If you look out on the x-axis with time, picture you're exercising at a really high capacity up to 14 seconds. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a high capacity to main maintain our adenosine triphosphate or ATP stores uh, maximally. You can see that they come down almost immediately so to sacrifice or maintain this peak of ATP for maybe up to 10 seconds, you can see that fossil creatine substantially has decreased. And all fossil creatine is really doing is donating its high energy phosphate molecule to adenosine diphosphate. And that's hoping to maintain your ATP stores uh, more readily. So if this is a non-supplemented or non-creatine habitual dietary intake person here, the theory is if you increase the amount of fossil creatine, 
maybe this line will go a little bit longer. So now you're exercising at a much higher capacity and maybe you expand this energy system from 10 seconds to 12, maybe up to 14 seconds. For the average gym goer, that may not be um, that uh, applicable or apparent, but for an Olympic athlete, world champion, someone trying to train or enhance one, two seconds of a high energy capacity, that could have massive implications. The other indication is that we see that this is really where creatine comes into play. If you're doing multiple sets on a bench press, leg press, whichever, we see that sets two, three, and four may be having a greater training volume. You might be able to do more repetitions, even at a higher load. So therefore, creatine can potentially increase exercise training capacity. So this is kind of where creatine originated and got all its, its prominence. In the 1992 uh, Olympics is where a lot of athletes were supplementing with creatine and excelling. And then it's exploded. We're almost up to 1,000 research papers now on various mechanisms and applications with creatine. So the original theory is if you can increase high energy capacity, will that allow you to exercise longer, more frequent, and at a higher intensity? So what does the research tell us? There's a bombardment of research articles out there, um, and three of us that are, are talking and, and moderating today, uh, we've sort of uh, been very fortunate in the last two years, we've put out some really good critical reviews and looking at all the research articles. Um, but I want to focus on this one. Now, although this is primarily an aging adults, um, and this was led by Dr. Phil Chilibeck, it was probably the most comprehensive meta-analysis done. It was on such a large volume of individuals. And there's been four meta-analysis performed on older individuals and one on younger. And the nice thing is when you look at all the similarities or results, they, simil or they are similar uh, when it comes to muscle mass or lean tissue mass and strength. So collapsing all the data, this uh, happened to have 22 individuals, but a large cohort of males and females. Uh, resistance training was about two to three days a week, which is typical all the way up to a year. And various measurements here, uh, measuring fat-free mass or lean tissue mass. And the nice thing is on the side here, you can see that there's a, a number of uh, elegant studies that have been designed. They're comparing creatine to a placebo. But the overall key here is that when you're looking at muscle mass and strength, very rare does creatine have a beneficial effect without the stimulus of resistance training. So when you look at all the meta-analysis, we think that creatine needs to be combined with resistance training for the majority of research or evidence to uh, be produced. So when you perform the meta-analysis and look at all the studies, creatine seems, when it's combined with resistance training, to increase lean tissue mass by about 1.33 kilograms compared to placebo and resistance training. So for those who don't wanna take creatine supplementation, you still get phenomenal improvements with resistance training. However, on average, if you combine creatine supplementation with resistance training, you should expect about a 1.33 kilogram greater increase or about three pounds over time. That could have massive implications for an athlete, exercising individual, and of course, as we talk about aging individuals who are suffering muscle loss, this could have massive clinical applications. So of course, muscle mass is one of the main precursors uh, that we're all trying to achieve. You parlay that into upper body strength and we see very similar effects. When you combine all the data and look at creatine and resistance training versus placebo and resistance training, creatine actually have a, a statistical greater effect over time as well. So now you're starting to see an increase in strength, which has massive functionality uh, implications and muscle mass. But probably more importantly than upper body strength is the really important clinical findings with the lower body. Now, again, as I mentioned, this was in the lower body or in aging individuals, but this has massive implications again for younger individuals. As we get older, the lower body is more negatively affected than the upper body. We have larger muscles, uh, and we see that activities of daily living go down as we get older. We start to see activities uh, that are very minimal in intensity. We start to take the escalator, uh, uh, elevators more often. We don't typically engage in high impact sports. And the nice thing here is that when you look at all the previous data, including this one, for those who combine creatine and resistance training, they also get a really important uh, increase in lower body strength. So in summary, Creatine and resistance training will give you a greater increase in muscle mass, upper and lower body strength um, compared to placebo and resistance training. 
So in summary, resistance training is very beneficial. Creatine will give you a small greater effect. And I think that's something to consider depending on what population you're working with or if this is for your own goals. Now the mechanisms of creatine are quite diverse. Uh, we still are, I, I think in the infancy with new technology emerging, we're starting to paint a better picture. But I do wanna take a couple minutes uh, and talk about this, this uh, uh, slide or, or picture, so to speak, because I think a lot of myths or uh, questions that come up with creatine supplementation are primarily involved on the potential mechanisms of, of action. So I'm going to take a couple minutes to go through this very uh, slowly, and this will hopefully answer a lot of questions that uh, people have. So right off the bat, creatine directly will not increase muscle protein synthesis, okay? Protein, whey protein, essential amino acids, that will increase the rates of myofibular protein synthesis through a tracer. We haven't been able to show yet that creatine will actually directly increase muscle protein synthesis. However, we think unlike protein, creatine has a really multifactorial approach to the body. So for example, creatine will actually decrease or inhibit myostatin. Myostatin is an inhibitory growth uh, protein that sort of limits muscle uh, hypertrophy. And in animal models, creatine seems to downregulate this growth factor. So that's one potential reason why people who take creatine can increase muscle mass. The opposite end, it actually stimulates something called insulin-like growth factor one. It's one of our main anabolic growth factors, highly involved in bone development, but it also is highly uh, implicated in the muscle protein synthetic pathway. If you turn on insulin-like growth factor one, which creatine does, this will follow a nice pattern. AKT is another protein and mTOR is something that the viewers may have, have heard of, especially in the last decade. It's one of the main regulatory pathways in protein synthesis. The theory is if you can increase mTOR pathway, you get an increase in translation. I don't wanna bore you by going back to high school biology, but you can remember transcription and translation all translation meaning is the formation of amino acids into a protein around the ribosome. So the theory is that if creatine can increase insulin-like growth factor one, it'll turn on this really elegant pathway, and that could help explain an increase in muscle hypertrophy. You actually get an increase in protein kinases downstream in this mTOR pathway. Uh, Mark Tarnopolsky from McMaster University showed that in a really elegant paper. So although it doesn't directly increase the mTOR pathway, it seems to turn on some of these downstream kinases. So when someone says creatine only leads to water retention, we actually think that's not true. We actually see some evidence of some cellular adaptations. Coinciding with this pathway, uh, Darren Willoughby from uh, the United States has done some really good elegant work on myogenic regulatory factors. These are sort of the spark plug of your car. These are sort of things that turn on transcription or the DNA process to make a protein. And so if creatine can actually turn these processes on, it actually will help stimulate something that we think is really important in muscle hypertrophy. And these are called satellite cells. And if you turn on these satellite cells, these are cells that rely or reside between the sarcolemma and the basement membrane in between your muscles. And they're important because if you suffer any trauma or injury, they migrate to the area of inflammation or trauma, they donate their nucleus, and that can help increase the process of transcription or DNA sending signals to RNA. So again, another side branch is that creatine can actually increase myogenic regulatory factors, which simultaneously increase satellite cells. And then if you get an increase in satellite cell activation, that can increase potentially transcription. Again, another potential increase in hypertrophy. So on the left-hand side is sort of the anabolic potential of creatine. One thing I want to really highlight is that creatine itself is an osmotic property. And so by taking creatine, a lot of people say you put on water retention, and I would argue or suggest that that's a really good uh, a cellular uh, a signal to the cell. So when you sell or swell the muscle body or cell, it stimulates some of these pass pathways. So if creatine is osmotic, that can also help uh, cause an increase in the anabolic properties. One of the other potential uh, effects is the anti-catabolic properties or recovery. So FOXO or 4CAD uh, proteins, these are highly involved in protein breakdown or muscle damage. 
And the nice thing here is we see really good evidence to suggest that creatine decreases muscle breakdown. So if it potentially has an anabolic uh, uh, avenue and it decreases breakdown, you may get a net synergistic effect of muscle accretion or muscle mass. And some emerging evidence is suggesting that creatine can act as an anti-inflammatory in marathon runners and aerobic uh, trained individuals when they exercise for a high capacity, taking creatine before the event has been shown to decrease reactive oxidative species and cytokines, and therefore it could help decrease inflammation, allowing the individual to get back to the gym, track, whichever it is at a faster rate. And finally, creatine can potentially increase performance by increasing glycogen content or GLUT4 capacity. So I know this is very complex, um, but again, if you look and break it down, it seems that creatine has a potential anabolic effect. It definitely has an anti-catabolic effect. So these are some of the reasons we think that creatine does not just lead to water retention, but water retention or cell swelling can actually stimulate these pathways. So for your viewers, what is the optimal relative dosage? I think most of us are very familiar with the International Society of Sport Nutrition Stand. Three to five grams a day is very, very effective. You could even dump it down to two if you take it on a daily basis. But sometimes we say, what is it based on the average size? So relative means basing it on your body weight, um, 0 0.3 grams all the way up to 2.0 grams. So the majority of research that we've shown to be effective is about 0 0.1 grams per kilogram. So all you have to do is go on a scale. And if you're 70 kilograms, you take about seven grams a day. If you're 30 kilograms, take about three grams a day. Um, so if you'd like to do absolute, which is the easiest, Two to five grams is plenty. I don't think you need to go more than that if you take it on a daily basis for an extended period of time. Uh, but in some research, and this question gets uh, uh, often asked, 0 0.1 grams per kilogram. Um, we're actually looking at a dosing uh, study potentially uh, when we're allowed to get back in our research labs, looking at maybe 0 0.1 versus 0 0.2 and even higher. Maybe the creatine dosage uh, might be even more effective if we do it that way, so stay tuned for that. Uh, I talked uh, at the initial slide that creatine is found in food, and we just talked about two point or two to five grams of creatine or 0 0.1 gram over time. Um, I just wanted to highlight how difficult it is and why a lot of our studies use supplementation. But to get the amount of creatine, three grams, four grams, or five grams a day, you got to be eating a lot of seafood or beef on a daily basis. So financially, that can be really difficult. Ethically, a lot of vegetarians are watching. So this is why a lot, or if not all studies, focus on supplementation. It's very financially inexpensive, uh, and it, it actually has been shown to be very effective. Uh, there hasn't been a study ever that has looked at the effect of creatine through food products. So this is why we think to get this much creatine, you would have to eat about almost four pounds of cod to get five grams of creatine, where that's a half a teaspoon. Okay, so you can use this uh, um, chart, if you will, to, to look at that over time. When is the best time to consume creatine? This is very it's sort of piggybacked after the timing on protein. Is it before exercise, after exercise, or what about before going to bed? We did a, a, a meta-analysis. Scott actually uh, led the charge here. And ironically, the only three studies that specifically looked at timing uh, were by uh, myself, Dr. Scott Forbes, and Dr. Uh, Jose Antonio. And when we look at the data, and again, it's limited to three uh, studies, when we look at muscle mass, if you consume creatine post-exercise compared to pre-exercise, you get a small greater effect on muscle mass. Keep in mind though, if you take creatine before exercise, that is still very effective. But you get a slightly greater effect by consuming creatine post-exercise. Smaller effect is the p-value was 0 0.04. When it comes to upper body strength, there's no difference. So this is something that's very viable for your viewers. If you wanna consume creatine before exercise or after, I think you should expect that's a very viable strategy to get improvements. But again, post-exercise compared to pre with a very limited sample size may give you slightly greater effects. I wanna to touch now, it's hot off the press. This only came out about two weeks ago and we thought this was a very uh, interesting study because I know a lot of uh, viewers will drink branched chain amino acids during the workout and I see these people sipping on the branched chain amino acids through their their uh, training set and I thought well geez what about creatine could this be effective so uh, Scotty Mills my master student they looked at 22 participants and we said well let's mimic what a lot of individuals do during a workout they will sip 
or have a small dosage of, of some concoction post-set. So we base this relative, so this was 0 0.0055 grams per kilogram or less than a gram, obviously, post-set. So you would do 18 sets per training session. After each set, take a small mouthful of either creatine or placebo. Um, and this was five days a week. So only on training days. They didn't take it on the non-training days. And to my, in my opinion, I was actually surprised with the results. When you look at muscle thickness, um, statistically, there was no difference between placebo or creatine, although the magnitude of change for the majority of muscle groups was a bit higher um, and the effect size were smaller. So although both groups actually showed a potential increase uh, with the time p-value, except for the plantar flexors, there was a slightly greater increase in creatine, but we couldn't conclude uh, it was significant. However, what really surprised me uh, especially is when we got the strength. On the uh, uh, graph A is leg press, chest press, and then this is total body combining leg press and chest press. Interestingly enough, over six weeks of training, the individuals who cons consume creatine post-set had a substantial increase in one repetition maximum leg press, chest press, and of course, total body. Ironically, if they consume placebo, there was no change even over six weeks of tra training. So therefore suggesting that creatine actually had a potential, uh, an anabolic effect when it came to overall strength. So this is something that some of your viewers saying, hey, I'm really trying to emphasize strength. This could be something to consider. Again, it's the first study to look at creatine during a session. When it came to endurance, so picking 50% uh, of leg press and chest press one repetition maximum and doing one set to fatigue, uh, creatine again increased leg press strength. Uh, both groups, placebo and creatine, increased chest press. But when you combine the two, uh, creatine had a superior effect. So it was nice to conclude that creatine uh, actually had a greater effect on uh, leg press, chest press in, uh, uh, strength, as well as endurance. So that had application for a lot of individuals. And it was a viable strategy um, comparing pre and post. So we think creatine in close proximity to resistance training uh, sessions is a very effective or viable strategy. A lot of viewers will ask, can I take it any other time of the day? Absolutely. But sometimes it's nice to know that if you had to choose around uh, resistance training uh, sessions, it is effective. I'll switch uh, uh, as I'm running out of time over to bone. Um, this is sort of an emerging process. Anybody that's in physiotherapy or going down to medicine, this is kind of an area that there's been about 10 studies published now on bone um, and the back it up a little bit, understanding the basic bone remodeling process. We want these osteoclast cells, which are involved in bone breakdown to break down uh, our calcium from our ske uh, skeleton, if it's abnormally formed or in times of need, and that will stimulate osteoblast cells to take the calcium and repackage it into stronger, harder, or greater matrix. And lo and behold, almost by accident, about a decade ago, some cellular biologists found that when you incubate or put creatine in close proximity to osteoblast cells, this bone remodeling process is increased. And therefore, the speculation is what if a human being or even a rodent consumed creatine, could that increase the bone remodeling process, laying down stronger, healthier bone? I wanna to touch on one of the rare studies that have actually showed some promise. I will give you a caveat that the majority of research on creatine and bone has yet to uh, have a consensus that it actually will improve bone mineral density and bone mineral content from a majority perspective. But there are some times that it has application. This study was published a couple of years ago in Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise. And at the time it was the longest creatine trial to look at bone mineral density with resistance training. So these individuals, postmenopausal females, exercised for one entire year. Uh, they took 0.1 gram per kilogram every day of creatine, and they combined that with re supervised resistance training three times a week, or the other individuals consume placebo. And this, again, was one of the rare studies to show some promise. I just want to highlight what we think is one of the main factors uh, moving forward, and I hope the bone research uh, takes off. But this is a change in the femoral neck bone mineral density, or think of the hip region. Now, sadly, even over an entire year of resistance training and creatine or placebo, the group mean was not above zero. In other words, even an entire year of creatine and resistance training, these individuals on average did not improve 
hip bone mineral density. So we think the aging process can be very detrimental to bone, especially in postmenopausal females where the lack of estrogen is evident. However, when you do and run the statistics, creatine, you can see that the rate of loss is way lower than the females on placebo. So it was concluded that creatine attenuated the rate of bone mineral loss in the hip. Whereas unfortunately, if those individuals on placebo, they suffered a lot greater loss of bone mineral density. So creatine was kind of acting as an anti-catabolic agent to bone, but again, it did not get above zero. We think longer trials, two, three, even up to five years of training, a bone takes a long time to turn over. Uh, and so therefore, a lot of the studies that are on uh, creatine and bone may not be long enough. We think this had massive clinical application because it seemed to reduce, compared to placebo, the rate of bone mineral loss. So for all the individuals watching, your mother, grandmother, whichever it is, if they're on bisphosphonates or have a history of osteoporosis, this is something to consider. Uh, we don't think creatine by itself would have any uh, beneficial effects on bone if it's not combined with resistance training. So we thought this was clinically significant because fracture of the hip is one of the main causes of functional impairment. So really creatine was preserving bone mineral density in this region, whereas females on placebo, uh, it was increasing. Could this have application for false prevention? Up here in Canada, we get a lot of snow, a lot of ice, and this is highly evident. So if an older individual would fall and fracture a hip, unfortunately that can lead to premature morbidity. And in one of our recent papers we uh, published last year, we actually did a sub-meta analysis within the paper. And when you look at the effects of creatine and resistance training versus placebo, and this was primarily in aging adults, sit the stand, which is a, a really functional test, but it's also a strong prediction of falls, uh, was decreased when creatine was taken in resistance training. So now not only does it potentially increase muscle mass, upper and lower body strength, potentially decrease some of the bone mineral loss, it actually now has some promise for increasing functionality and specifically sit the stand, which is highly involved in clinical settings. It's a strong predictor of a fall. So if you can increase sit the stand performance, that may decrease the rate of falls or fracture. Is creatine safe? I think uh, Dr. Antonio posted this a couple of years ago. I love it because there's so many myths and we, we can talk about that in the Q&A or we do have a big paper coming out but creatine, we think, is one of the safest, most effective ergogenic or dietary supplements for overall muscle performance uh, and recovery. And when you look at all the science, compared to placebo, uh, there's no greater increase in side effects. So in summary, resistance training, if it's not important, it's almost crucial to get the magical powers of creatine. Viable dosages, absolute, three to five grams a day is plenty. I think that's going to be the easiest for most people. Some people will ask about a loading phase. I think that's very viable. You will saturate the muscle in about seven days. But if you do hear about GI tract irritations or, or excessive water retention or bloating, that can be during the loading phase. Um, we primarily use a relative uh, dosage because we usually uh, work with different sexes, male or female, larger individuals. 0 0.1 gram per kilogram is effective. And again, we just published that paper two weeks ago. If you say, I don't want to take it any other times a day, it's very convenient for me to take it during my workout. 0 0.0055 grams per kilogram, go on the scale, that's less than a half a gram. You would mix your uh, creatine in a big bo uh, water bottle, maybe up to a liter, and sip on that throughout your workout. It's been shown to be effective from a strength and endurance perspective. So pre-workout, intra and post are viable and effective strategies. Uh, safety when compared to placebo, there's no greater adverse effects. Again, if you have specific questions that you're not comfortable asking me in the Q&A or uh, whichever down the road. Uh, if you want to follow me on social media, there's all my handles. Um, so I think now, Dr. Antonio, I'll just stop sharing and then is it go to Scott? Is that correct? Yeah, it goes directly to Scott now. Okay, so I'll stop this. <laughs> and okay. Okay, I'm up. Uh, thanks, Dr. Antonio and ISSN for the opportunity to present alongside the phenomenal Dr. Kando. Uh, my name is Scott Forbes. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Physical, in, uh, Physical Education at Brandon University in Canada and an adjunct professor at the University of Regina in Kinesiology and Health Studies.
Um, following the presentation, if you'd like more information, please do not hesitate to contact me through Instagram or email as well. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Kando for leading off this webinar. He did an outstanding job um, outlining the overwhelming evidence that creatine combined with exercise can really enhance muscle and bone health. So my presentation's gonna focus on a more emerging area of research, the impact of creatine on the brain. So I have four major objectives. So first, I'll discuss how creatine is synthesized and taken up in the brain, specifically outlining key differences from what is known in the muscle. Secondly, does supplementing with creatine enhance brain creatine levels? So if we supplement with it, can we actually get more creatine into the brain? I'm gonna overview some of the potential mechanisms whereby creatine in theory may augment or enhance brain function. And last but not least, um, what is the current level of evidence examining creatine on cognitive performance? So I'm gonna start by expanding on, on what Dr. Uh, Darren Kando has already suggested and discussed and identify key muscle and brain differences with regards to creatine transportation and synthesis. So as Darren already mentioned, um, creatine is formed in the liver and kidney from three amino acids, glycine, arginine, and methionine. And this is actually a two-step process, and each step requires an enzyme. So for short, it's AGAT um, for the first step, and the second step is GAMT. You can also ingest creatine in your diet, but tissues must have the ability to transport creatine from the periphery or blood. Once in the bloodstream, about 95% of creatine is taken up by the muscle, with the remaining taken up by other tissues, which includes the brain. So since 95% of creatine is, is stored in the muscle, this has led researchers to focus on that particular target tissue, uh, including Dr. Darren Kando, back when he had hair. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna convince him today and those watching the webinar that, that creatine is also vital for brain health. So the strongest evidence demonstrating how critical creatine is for brain health is from individuals with creatine deficiency syndrome. So these individuals have a genetic mutation which either um, affects one of the enzymes important for creatine synthesis, or um, it can affect SLC6A8, which is the creatine transporter. So that's required to transport creatine from the blood to the cells, either into the brain or into the muscle. So individuals with creatine deficiency syndrome have no creatine in their brains. And associated with these genetic genetic mutations is what is characterized as a severe neurodevelopmental delay. So I think that's some of the strongest evidence that we have that creatine is really important and critical for brain health. Um, so how do we get creatine into the brain? Well, here's a little uh, question period for you guys. So is it A, 100% from the periphery, B, a mix from the periphery or the blood and formed in the brain, or C, 100% um, um, is formed in the brain. Or sorry, 100%, yeah, formed in the brain since creatine cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. So it's actually B. So it's both formed in the brain and it's taken up from the periphery. So this is the difference between the brain and the muscle. The muscle cannot synthesize creatine, but the brain can. So the brain has the ability to synthesize creatine, and creatine can cross the blood-brain barrier. However, importantly, it, it's at a limited capacity. So the muscle, it seems like the more creatine you give it, the more it can take up, um, up to a certain value. But um, within the brain, it's, it's harder to do that. And so I'm gonna show you some of the evidence to suggest that there is actually a difference between the brain and the muscle. 
So the best resource for the latest scientific census, and, and Karen mentioned this as well, on creatine is the position stand by the ISSN, um, and it was led by Dr. Kreider. They show that dietary intake has a large and robust impact on muscle creatine content. So this is one of the figures presented in that uh, publication. And since, I'm just gonna focus on the left side of that figure. So since creatine is mostly comes from meat, vegetarians have a lower muscle creatine content than meat eaters. So this has been shown over and over in the literature, suggesting that at the muscle level, the amount of creatine in the diet or bloodstream is a very good predictor of creatine content within the muscle. In the brain, it is less clear. So here's some great work from Bruno Golano's lab that shows that despite the vegetarians eating less creatine, so that's depicted here on the figure on the left. So you can see the vegetarians consume less creatine in their diet. They actually had similar amounts of creatine in the brain as shown on the figure on the right. So this suggests that the brain is less susceptible to creatine in the diet than muscle is. Okay, so we know that the brain can synthesize its own creatine and habitual dietary intake appears to be less effective at altering brain content. So what if we load with creatine and take a creatine supplement? Can that elevate brain creatine levels? So I'm gonna direct the viewers to a very nice review written by a friend of mine, Eric Rawson and colleagues. I was fortunate to hang out with him last year at a conference. He spoke at, uh, at the University of Regina and I got to meet him there. But he also spoke at uh, ISSN in Vegas as well as a keynote. So he summarized all the data examining creatine supplementation on the brain. So based on the available literature, it was 12 studies included, there does appear to be a small, about a five to 10% increase in brain creatine content. So these values were based on total creatine content. Phosphocreatine levels also appear to increase, but to a smaller degree. So in contrast to the muscle, that has a predictable and robust response, whereby creatine content increases approximately 20%, much, uh, which is much larger than the five to 10% that we see when you supplement with fairly large doses of creatine um, in the brain. So for future research is definitely needed to evaluate day-to-day -day changes to see if these, that 5% increase is, is truly an increase. Um, and also a dose response curve. So Kando suggested that maybe three to five grams a day is sufficient to saturate muscle creatine content, but in the brain it actually may require more creatine and perhaps for, for longer periods of time. So we just don't know. So future research definitely needs to do a, a, a well-designed dose response study to evaluate that. So we have evidence that supplementing with creatine can increase brain creatine levels. In theory, how would this benefit the brain? So first, the brain is highly metabolically active. So it's responsible for about 20% of energy expenditure or basal metabolism, despite accounting for just 2% of body mass. So the brain is therefore reliant on a constant energy supply in order to fulfill all functions, including um, maintenance of electrical membrane potentials, action potential propagation, peripheral nervous system and central nervous system signaling. So it requires ATP. So breakdown of phosphocreatine and replenish ATP, as Karen discussed as well. So there's other potential mechanisms, potentially to reduce oxidative, oxidative stress in the brain, um, improved mitochondrial membrane potential, and regulation of sodium potassium ATPase. So that, thus it appears that creatine supplementation can increase brain creatine levels, and in theory would enhance ATP energetics. But does this actually translate to enhanced brain function? 
So in rats, there's a growing body of literature suggesting that creatine supplementation, and in this particular study, it was, it was conducted in my home province, Manitoba, and they looked at creatine supplementation over four weeks, and they showed that the rats could learn better, um, their memories improved, and also their brain mitochondrial function was improved as well. So I can already hear uh, Dr. Antonio rumbling that uh, rats are not humans. Is there any evidence in humans? I'm gonna tell you the answer is yes, there is. So in a recent systematic review in healthy adults, which included six randomized controlled trials, so those are the best types of studies to identify a causal claim, concluded that creatine may improve short-term memory and intelligence and reasoning. So here's a summary slide of the six studies in healthy adults, and this was just at rest. So it's important to note the large heterogeneity between the studies. So it makes comparing one study to another rather difficult. For example, studies have used both absolute and relative doses, and the doses range quite a bit as well. The duration ranged from five days to six weeks, and some used vegetarians, although that might have a less of an impact on cognitive processes in the brain. And the tests used to, identify, uh, to assess cognitive processes also range greatly between studies as well. So depending if you're looking at memory, speed, executive function, intelligence, or attention, um, there is inconsistency within the literature. But overall, there's some positive effects showing as indicated by the happy faces, and some results showing no effect. But importantly, not a single study showed a detrimental effect on the brain. So it's either positive or no effect. And what about if the brain is stressed? So again, Dr. Kando mentioned that creatine is most effective when it's combined with resistance exercise. So you need to stress the muscle to get the benefit of creatine. So what about the brain? Maybe it's, maybe it's similar in the brain as well. So when the brain is stressed, you can really see the effects of creatine. So how can you stress the brain? Um, there's a few ways to do that. In this study, they, re they reduce the amount of oxygen going to the brain. So that's known as hypoxia or oxygen deprivation. They had 15 healthy participants perform a crossover design. One condition, they received creatine, 20 grams per day for seven days, compared to a placebo. Um, and there was a five-week five washout period between. So creatine supplementation resulted in nine, a 9.2% increase in brain content following supplementation. So they got more creatine into the brain and they measured it, so that's nice to see. And from a cognitive performance standpoint, what we know is that when you get less oxygen to the brain, your cognitive processes go down. And that says, that's shown in the open bars here. If you took creatine, it attenuated or completely washed out the effects of low oxygen or hypoxia. So creatine was effective at enhancing cognitive function when the brain was stressed. Another way to stress the brain is with a lack of sleep. So again, we know with sleep deprivation, cognitive scores get worse. But if supplemented with creatine, the effects of sleep deprivation was attenuated. So that is creatine significantly reduced decrements and choice reaction time, balance, mood state, following sleep deprivation. In this particular study, they found that creatine increased executive function, which is like decision-making ability, and it was measured with a Stroop test, following 90 minutes of a mentally fatiguing task compared to placebo. So again, if you do something for 90 minutes that requires a lot of uh, fatigue in your brain, that could reduce your cognitive performance. But if you took creatine, it was maintained. And then very recently, in fact, it's accepted for publication, but it hasn't been published yet. Um, and thanks to my friend, Dr. Machado, for providing me the manuscript. In this study, they looked at a group of semi-professional mountain bikers, and creatine significantly improved uh, its go-no-go -no -go reaction time following 
a challenging 19 kilometer bike ride. So pretty cool data, again, to show that even after exercise, that creatine can help your cognition. So here's some of the data right there showing the, the improved reaction time with the creatine supplementation. So there's a great debate whether these paper and pen or computerized cognitive tests predict sport performance. So however, some research has examined skills or movements that are considered more cognitive in nature. For example, a motor skill may be measuring maximal strength, like a 1RM test. A cognitive movement might, might be something like shooting accuracy. So this study here examined rugby players, and they looked at passing accuracy when sleep deprived. And so they found that when sleep deprived, represented by the open squares, passing accuracy went down. So it makes sense. You don't get enough sleep. You wake up in the morning, you have to do a, an accurate pass. Your skill is going to go down. But when taking creatine, the effects of sleep deprivation on this cognitive skill, passing accuracy, was attenuated or washed out, either at a, a low dose, which was 50 milligrams per kilogram, or a higher dose, 100 milligrams per kilogram. That's showing right there. There were two other studies in, in soccer players examining shooting accuracy, but they actually found no effect of creatine supplementation. Again, I think this demonstrates that creatine may be more effective when the brain is actually stressed, sleep deprivation. Two soccer studies were just at rest in a non-sleep deprived state. So other really interesting areas of research where creatine may be a benefit is in situations where brain creatine levels are actually reduced. These include following a mild traumatic brain injury. And there's actually research in rats to suggest that creatine can be neuroprotective. Another time creatine is reduced is following cumulative head impacts in former NFL players. So again, creatine might be protective or maybe a viable strategy to help improve their cognition after that occurs. And then also in Alzheimer's patients as well, there's evidence to show that creatine, brain creatine content is actually reduced. So I'd, I would suggest that all these areas require further research to be more conclusive whether creatine could be of benefit in those situations. So just end off here with a few final take home points. Um, creatine is synthesized in the brain, which is different than in the muscle. And it can cross the blood brain barrier at a limited rate. Creatine can increase brain creatine content levels. There is evidence for that. However, it occurs at a smaller rate compared to what happens in the muscle, it's less robust. So a higher dose or longer periods of time may be required. And then creatine supplementation can increase cognitive function in healthy adults, especially during stress. So whether it's hypoxia, sleep deprivation, mental fatigue, or challenging exercise, there's very clear evidence that that could be of, of benefit. So I'm just gonna end off by thanks for listening. As mentioned at the start of the presentation, if you want any of the research, have any comments or questions, please do not hesitate to contact me by email or through Instagram. Okay, thanks Scott. Um, Dr. Antonio's uh, audio um, is not working properly. Uh, so I'll uh, just say a, a few, uh, those remarks. Um, again, we summarized uh, in a short period of time some of the effects on muscle, bone, exercise performance, and obviously cognitive and, and neuro uh, uh, control. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, if you have any specific questions for myself or Dr. Forbes, again, please email us or follow us on social media, and, and you can direct the, the uh, questions there. Um, if you have any questions regarding the webinar or the content dissemination of that, please email uh, Dr. Antonio at ISSN 
Um, and uh, just a, a couple words about the upcoming annual ISSN conference, still uh, a scheduled September 10th to the 12th in Florida. Um, and check out the website at ISSN.net. Uh, the webinar is recorded. Um, so if there's any other specific questions, uh, Dr. Antonio, anything I leave out or? No, I think we're good. Uh, I just hope people can hear me. I know my audio tends to go in and out. It's just it's odd. Um, where can we find the recordings? I'll have the recordings done by the end of the day. And typically they get emailed out to people a week or so afterwards. They just have to email me uh, and ask okay. for them. And, oh, and there's a couple questions. Do you want us to answer those uh, now or? Yeah, go ahead and answer them now, you and Dr. Forbes. Yeah, and so uh, a question is, do we uh, uh, repeat the question and answer it verbally for everybody or is this a, yeah, okay. So there's a question, is there an estimated relative contribution of the fossil creatine system to brain energy needs compared to other systems? And I'll let Dr. Forbes uh, answer that. Um, I, I don't know the, the exact uh, contribution offhand, but uh, it would also depend on um, the stress that the brain is under. So it seems like if you're sleep deprived or have mental fatigue, that that requires a higher demand from that energy system. Um, so that's a great question. And I'll try to find the answer and follow up with me for sure. Okay. And the second question, after a cessation of creatine supplementation, uh, this is a very popular question. How long might it take to see the beneficial effects that you get through supplementation uh, come back to baseline? There's only been a, a, a few studies that have looked at this. Most people would be familiar with the Vandenberg study in 1996, and they showed it takes about four weeks. So if you've saturated the muscle uh, through a supplementation phase, and then you stop supplementing, uh, fossil creatine levels can take about 28 days or potentially even longer to come back. Now, keep in mind, if you're continually training during that period, they may stay elevated. Uh, and we published a paper looking at the effects of creatine cessation in older males. And we measured them 12 weeks after they've taken creatine for a period of 12 weeks. And the rate of loss was a little bit higher um, than um, endurance, or sorry, than placebo. But the benefits were still about the same. So although we didn't measure any mechanistic actions, uh, some of the effects uh, were preserved. So in general, we usually recommend if you stop supplementing with creatine, it can take uh, about four weeks or even longer before those potential fossil creatine levels come back. But keep in mind, if you continue to train, a lot of your strength gains and even muscle mass will be maintained. So some people ask about creatine cycling. Uh, we're not aware of any evidence to suggest that creatine cycling is either needed or superior to continuous um, uh, cycling and until a study does that. Uh, and we see no adverse effects, even long-term trials of over two years. So we think daily uh, or continuous creatine supplementation is probably more preferable. Uh, in working with elite uh, endurance athletes, the debate is constantly comes up. If I'm eating enough protein, why would I supplement with creatine? What uh, answer would you give to these athletes? So Scott, if you want to take that or I can, it's up to you. <laughs> Yeah, so that, uh, the question specifically to elite endurance athletes. Right. Um, there's actually a really cool study that was done by Louise Burke out of the Australian Institute of Sport, um, where she supplemented people with creatine and carbohydrates. And the creatine actually helps to bring in more carbohydrates into the muscle to enhance more glycogen. Um, so there's some mechanisms that creatine, it works differently than protein per se. And then also there's evidence that if you resistance train, taking creatine and protein leads to bigger and stronger muscles compared to just protein alone. So um, consuming both supplements could be a benefit. Okay. Would body weight training combined with creatine be considered enough to get the benefit of creatine on muscle mass, such as push-ups, high uh, knees, squat jumps, et cetera? I think any mechanical stimulus to your own body that you feel is what we consider overloading or um, resistance um, can be effective. So plyometrics, push-ups, whichever it is, as long as you're actually engaging skeletal muscle uh, fiber recruitment, that seems to be the catalyst uh, 
uh, for creatine to sort of work its magic. There is a handful of studies that have looked at creatine without exercise and shown to be uh, uh, sometimes effective, more so in clinical populations. Uh, but yeah, body weight training. I know a lot of people right now train with weighted vests or military vests or uh, uh, different plyometrics. I think anything that taxes the muscle, creatine would potentially just give it a, a small greater effect. And, and, and that's probably the consensus to the creatine literature. Um, any other questions? Okay, not seeing any more. Um, again, uh, keep in mind the ISSN uh, National Conference uh, in September. Check out the ISSN.net uh, uh, webpage. It has all the information there. Uh, there's other future webinars coming up as well. I believe there's three or four more coming. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Again, if you have any specific questions for uh, myself or Dr. Forbes or, or uh, Dr. Antonio regarding the webinar, please let us know. Uh, thanks for attending and uh, all the best. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Right, take care. Yeah. Okay. Take care, guys.